Again, my name is Marty Lewis. I can be found on Instagram at MJ Lewis Art. I have lived in Austin, Texas for about 16 years. I'm originally from Santa Barbara, California, and uh, was transplanted here about 16 years ago. About five years ago, I started really getting involved in the art community uh, in Austin, Texas. And I just want to say and give a shout out to Austin as being an amazing place to start a platform uh, as an artist. Um, as most people know, Austin is, is kind of known for uh, two things, Longhorn football and music. And the art community here, I have found, um, although beautiful is, is very lacking, but over the years, I've just seen it increase so much and, and do want to give uh, a huge thank you to the Doherty uh, and for what they do for the public here in Austin, Texas. Um, I've been privileged to uh, um, um, go to a number of shows at the Doherty. It's a beautiful gallery. If you haven't had a chance to go, I highly recommend it. It's a, just a gorgeous space to see art and to meet other artists. Um, like I just previously said, I started getting involved really in the arts about five years ago. Um, maybe a little bit longer now. Uh, I have two young daughters and um, I was asked at one point when they were in elementary school to kind of head up the uh, art projects for a lot of the students. And I just found with some of my background in art history and just for the love of arts in a very classical, classically trained manner that this was something that I wanted to do. Um, I think that each and every single one of us has the opportunity to develop an artistic love and be a creative if only you just took the time to access that. Now, um, today we're going to be doing a diorama collage. Do I only work in dioramas? Do I only work in this particular um, outlet? No, that's not at all. As you can see on my art page, which Annie is going to highlight here shortly, I am a mixed media artist. It's funny when people ask me, what kind of artist are you? And I say, I'm a mixed media artist. A lot of times they're like, well, what does that mean? And in a nutshell to me, it's like, I'm an artist that just deals in all sorts of things. I don't find one medium to be better than the other. I find in an overwhelming sense at times that anything can become a creative art project. The history of collage in and of itself has been one that has been quite tumultuous throughout the years and throughout the centuries, but has been a type of fine art just as long as that. You look at the history of collage and you look at the history um, of that art movement. And you want to say really that the Dadaists um, after and during World War I were the ones who really highlighted and made collage into a fine art. And um, I do love a lot of the Dadaists, but you have to even look back further in the history of art. When you think in the 17th century, there was French artists that were doing a lot of collage and they were doing decoupage and creating different pieces of art in the same manner that I will create a piece of art for you all today. But um, with that being said, uh, Annie, if you wanna go ahead and pull up my art page at this point, just kind of look at a few things and I would highly recommend, of course, um, if you have an opportunity to, to look at the art page or the Instagram page when and if you find the time or the desire to do so. A lot of the pieces that I have been creating lately are for the show 
that is going to be at the Doherty in September that I'll be having. And um, it's going to be, quote unquote, a mixed media show. Uh, it's going to be a, a fabulous show of found objects, if you will. Um, one of the things that I really, really find to be very important for me is the integrity of the piece. Now, what do I mean by the integrity of the piece? I want to try to find an object that exists in nature, whether it be man-made or naturally made, and use that and keep it in its finest form original. Um, one of the things that I do not like to do, although you're going to see me do it today because of time restraints, is photocopy or make multiple pieces. A lot of people have asked me, well, why don't you do prints? Or why don't you do bigger pieces of art? And the truth of the matter is, is I just don't want to. Um, I feel like the size of my work, although some big, in a small fashion can pretty much fit anywhere in somebody's collection. And that is important, of course, to find something that's gonna fit. I'm not one of those artists that likes to create a piece to go with my decor. And, um, and that's been a challenge because a few people have asked me to commission pieces and I do, I absolutely do commission work, but I just don't like duplicating things. Have I photocopied before? Yes, I have photocopied before, but only one time. And that was when I was commissioned to, to do a piece that the individual wanted a certain size of. And um, I thought, well, let me just give this a try. And so I did do a photocopy, but I like to keep everything in its original form. If I find a frame, for example, that I wanna use for a piece, I wanna keep that frame in its natural condition, chips, tears, rips, bangs, whatever it is. But you've got a lot of different pieces that Annie is highlighting for my Instagram. I'm just trying to see, I do, I do, I work with a sketchbook a lot. A lot of my ideas uh, come when I'm not around, of course, just like everybody's art, artistic um, prowess does. And I will do sketches at times. I like to have a notebook with me at all times. Uh, my favorite kind of notebook to use is a moleskin. Um, it's kind of uh, the history of moleskin, I think is, is really beautiful. And if you don't know it, I would highly recommend that you look at moleskin because it's just for the artist uh, and the artist world, it's just a beautiful, beautiful journal to use. And I really, really like the paper that's in it. But again, I use that for sketchbook purposes. I use it for um, watercolor. I use it for gouache and uh, I use it for pen and ink and graphite. But as you can see on the art page there, there's it's just random. Um, this one here, I wanted to highlight real quick, uh, the one with the hat, um, the, the red band on the hat, it's right in the center there. That right there <clears throat> is kind of my canvas. Um, the piece is, is the, uh, um, the invisible man. The hat itself is an original hat that I cut out from a uh, 1940s, 1950s life magazine. And what it's affixed to is uh, just a tattered uh, book cover uh, that I found. And um, I just used, found it as is. And it looked, you know, kind of like that shadow that's below the hat there or that dark spot of the hat kind of looked um, almost like a, a coat of sorts. And um, what I did there is then took the hat, glued it on there, painted the bandana around the hat and then affixed it as is, didn't touch it. And that's one thing that I really, really inspire to do is to keep thing is, things in its original form. Um, and then put my own artistic touch on it, of course, uh, by, by painting the, um, the bandana on the hat. Anyway, uh, I use a lot of that kind of uh, canvas, if you will, and I'll just call it a canvas because that's where the inspiration comes from is my, my, my blank canvas is that book plate. I spend lots and lots of time uh, in, in bookstores, lots of time in Goodwill, antique vintage stores, estate sales, just looking for whatever I can find that may at some point be uh, fixed 
uh, and used for a piece of work. Um, I, I would show you my room, but it's my art space is about a 200 square foot room in my home. And uh, it has everything pretty much that I need. But with that being said, I want to take the opportunity to read something really quickly because I'm assuming that there's probably a lot of artists that are here. And um, I, one of the things that I really, really recommend and aspire to do is to learn as much as I can about art and to, to engage with other artists. And I highly, highly recommend not only to study art in this fashion, but get to know other artists, learn about other artists' techniques and be inspired by other artists because that's what we are, are good for, right? Is we want to inspire. That's why we create to inspire. But Robert Henri is one of my favorite American artists and he's a fine artist, um, if you will, in respects to how he paints. He's more of a realist, but his book, The Artist's Spirit, and I'm just gonna hold this up right here, is probably one of the books when I first started studying art that some other artists that I love and admire said, you've got to read this book, Marty. And um, it's just his musings and his essays to students uh, about different techniques, about shadowing, about models, about selling art even, uh, about getting out in the public and community. But one of the things that I wanted to read that I just love that really resonated with me um, and has resonated with me in the past is a passage. It's on page 87 of the book and the title of it is Seeing in Italics. It is harder to see than it is to express. The whole value of art rests in the artist's ability to see well into what is before him. This model is wonderful in as many ways as there are pairs of eyes to see her or it. Each view of her is an original view and there is response in her awaiting each view. If the eyes of a Rembrandt are upon her, she will rise in response and Rembrandt will draw what he sees and it will be beautiful. Rembrandt was a man of great understanding. He had the rare power of seeing deep into the significance of things. And then I'm gonna go ahead and skip through it. And it says here, with the seer, it is different. Nothing will do but the most precise statement. He must not only blend technique to his will, but he must invent technique that will especially fit his need. He is not one who floats affably in the culture. He is the blazer of the road for what he has to bring. Those who get their technique first, expecting sight to come them later, get a technique of a very ready-made order. To study technique means to make it, to invent it, to take the raw material each time anew and twist it into shape. It must be made to serve a specific purpose. The same technique must never be used again. Each time it must be made new and fresh. A stock of set phrases won't do. The study is a development of wit. And with that, I'll go ahead and start. Okay, so some of the things that I use as a collage artist is Yes Paste. It's an acid-free. It's about 14 bucks for a, a size of a can like this. It's um, water-soluble, so it's easy. And it's uh, like it says, it's acid-free. So it shouldn't really show up on the work. I do use glue sticks, although I don't favor them. It's just uh, easy to use. It's very quick. Again, it's water soluble, uh, which I do like just in case I need to just gently water it down and um, remove a piece. Um, I sometimes will use epoxy, which I will be doing today to fix, uh, affix heavier items um, to a diorama like I'm going to be doing today. But the tools that are most important to me as a collage artist, of course, are scissors. Um, I have some very beautiful scissors, both German and American made. Um, these are my favorite ones right here. They're actually just some, some um, barbershop scissors that I found uh, at a estate sale. They were made in Germany, just a beautiful, beautiful set. I have all sorts of different scissors for cutting into the nuance and, uh, of the piece to get the perfect cut. And then I finally have a, a razor blade and scalpel. 
I like to use surgical blades um, that uh, have the finest tip on them. I use a size 11 primarily. There are different sizes, but I prefer a size 11. And again, they're just out barred Parker. They're a little bit more expensive, but man, they cut just beautifully. Um, all, you know, surgeons use them in hospitals for surgical cases. So why not use them on paper as well? I have um, this little palette knife that I use. Is this the only one that I use? No, absolutely not. I have all different size of palette knives to affix glue, to, to, to put paper down, et cetera. Um, of course, Mod Podge, I like to use Mod Podge. I, you have to be really careful with Mod Podge though. If the paper isn't right, and if you put too much Mod Podge on the paper, you'll see that it gets kind of a wrinkly kind of effect to it, and that can ruin the piece. Being that I use all original stuff, I have to be really careful with the application of glue. I find that the paper that is older, it's heavier and more durable, and you're not going to have that kind of crinkly or that wavy effect from it. I like to use magazines that are like 1970s and older because the paper, the quality of the paper was just beautiful. And, um, and a lot of the stuff even before that, 1920s, 1930s, even you know stuff that I've used in the 1800s, the paper quality is just gorgeous. Yes, it was mass produced, but it's not mass produced like it's today, like on that silky kind of just throwaway paper. Um, of course, I have all my other tools as well, my writing utensils. Uh, I am a mixed media artist, as you all know. And so I just want to share like this box of things that I have. I find stuff all over the place. Um, rusted material, old cans, an, an old spigot handle that I'll use, a razor blade that I found on the street somewhere. One of the things that I love to use is um, rusted uh, wire. And all you can find that all over the place, right? So I just find pieces that I love to just pick up and find a little cog that I found. Anyway, it's, 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 it's mind numbing how much stuff as a mixed artist, mixed media artist that you can find. And you can just see, this is just a fraction of, of the things that I have. I have binfuls of this stuff, but anyway, so that's kind of where I'm at. And then like this here, is just an old book that I have. This is a uh, little big book that I found and I just love this paper. It's very fragile though, as you can see, I just barely touch it and it breaks. So you gotta be really careful with the, uh, the manner in which you handle this stuff because it's just so fragile, but I love that. I love the fragility of this stuff. So anyway, we're doing the diorama today. Um, I use a cigar box, this is, was my canvas. And hopefully you can see that. Um, I, I frequent a cigar lounge here and uh, I've actually had the honor of showing, uh, having an art show at the cigar lounge. And um, they, they provide me with a lot of these cigar boxes. Um, I prefer the wood ones because they just uh, really absorb paint beautifully and I'll paint on these. Um, and it's just, they're all just handmade. They're just gorgeous. And, um, and I like to use the, uh, keep the cigar, the outside of the box in its natural form. And there's a couple different reasons for that. I don't need to go into, but I just love looking at the wood grain, smelling the wood grain and so forth. So one of the first things that I did uh, was I found the cigar box that I was going to use today. It's bigger than this one. And I'm also going to go ahead and do a, um, demonstrate a photo transfer. Um, if you've never done a photo transfer, it's really, really easy. Um, even if I you don't explain it in its entirety right now, uh, you can Google it, how to photo transfer. I just have a nice light brush that I like to use um, for the glue. I'm going to go ahead and use Mod Podge. I'm just going to just pause for a quick second here and just say that again, because of time, I've had to go ahead and do a lot of what I'm doing beforehand just because it would just take days for us to get through this whole process. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and find the piece that I'm gonna use. And this is the actual piece that I'm gonna to use today. Hopefully y'all can see that, it's a print. This is the original um, print from a book that I cut out. 
I, however, did a photocopy of this for this photo transfer purpose. All you have to do for the photo transfer, of course, is you're gonna just go ahead and saturate the print with your Mod Podge or whatever glue you wanna use. You're gonna use a lot, don't be scared. It's gonna, it's gonna crinkle a little bit or it's gonna make waves on it, but don't be scared of that. So then I'm gonna go ahead and then I've got my water there, of course. You don't want your brush to just sit there and get hard. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just cut this little piece out. Not gonna be the cleanest because this is just for the demo. Just get all the, I, I'm really, when I'm doing collage, I don't like to have a lot of the, the white on it. For me, cutting out and making sure they're very clean cuts is super, super important to me because I just don't want to have any kind of, uh, you know, loose or non-meaningful piece. So I've already got the glue on the piece here, and then I'm going to just go ahead and shove it into the box. And I have someone um, asking if you can use PVA glue, and I'm assuming they mean for the transfer. I've never used PVA glue for the transfer, um, only because it's just so thick. So, I mean, you can pretty much, I think with, with photo transfer, depending on the material, you can pretty much use any kind of glue. But PVA is, is not one that I've used. Now, so I've already, I've got the, the side that I want for the photo, the photo transfer in the box, okay? You have to let that set for about 24 hours. I actually recommend that you let it set longer. Um, I, I've let pieces for photo transfer set for seven days, maybe a little bit longer even, and then go back to it. The biggest thing you wanna do is make sure that there's no bubbles. So you wanna really smooth it in. I have a, um, a little roller that I like to use to really get all the bubbles out. And just go ahead and do that. Now, so that's done. The photo transfer is now in the process. You don't wanna put glue over the top of it because it makes taking the paper off a little bit more difficult. Now, granted, I don't do a lot of photo transfer, but for this particular diorama, uh, it fit really well for the subject matter. Um, and um, I just absolutely love what's gonna happen here. So we've got that, just set it aside. We're gonna just go ahead and go over to a piece that I had affixed for photo transfer purposes and demonstration purposes. After you get the photo transfer done and it's dried over the next few hours or day or so, you're gonna go ahead and take a wet cloth and you're just gonna just rub, rub, rub. Now you pour gonna... water out of a soda water can. Is that actual soda water or did you just use the can to hold water? That is actual soda water because it was on my desk. <laughs> um, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Perfect. I just poured Hysteria. it there because it was there. Yeah, it, there's no, the bubble, the carbonation doesn't do anything. I just, I want to be able to drink some of it too. But if you can see here, the image that was on the other side is already starting to come through. It takes off the top layer, but the ink is gonna remain on the other side. And it's just beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. Someone is asking if you've tried photo transfer with tape. I've never tried photo transfer with tape, but that would be interesting. Are you all able to see the image coming through? Yeah. Okay. So this is the image that I wanted. It's not being used today, but I just wanted to show the photo transfer technique. Granted, the piece of paper, the, the, the image that I used, I glued on there two days ago. And then so I gave it two days to dry to demonstrate the technique. So lo and behold, you've got a beautiful image. It's all in reverse, of course, but that's okay if there's words on it, but the image itself comes through just beautifully. 
Sometimes you might have to take a little more time if you don't want the nuance of the old paper on there just to get it off. You gotta be really careful if you do photocopy though, you can erase the ink. This was not a photocopy photo transfer. So the ink is gonna stay on there a little bit better. When I made and prepared the diorama for today's demonstration, I did photocopy this. So the ink was really fresh. And when I was then taking off this top layer to reveal this image underneath, you, if I rubbed too hard, the ink would come off. Another reason I suggest you don't use photocopy, but use the original work itself. So in a nutshell, that's photo transfer, which I did today. If you can kind of just use your mind's eye and think about this box that I use for today's demonstration, I put it in like so, glued it in, let it dry, and then I photo transferred how it all came out like this. So this is the initial step of today's diorama and demonstration. It's of a bunch of birds, as you can see. Now, because when I got the photo transfer done, I'm just gonna gently kind of show here, you can see some of the remnants of the paper. You can gently just go around the images because I wanna make sure that the birds and the wood are highlighted here and you can take some of it off. You can get some of that white off of there. Now, granted, I pressed pretty hard when I was getting this off and some of the images of the birds and of the trees came off. So I had to then go ahead and, and I would recommend this too, just get your, your pencil or whatever for this particular one. And then I just went in and go ahead and color up some of the images here, highlight the birds, use Someone a Someone made comments uh, that they like how the grain of wood shows through the image. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. And that's one reason why I absolutely wanted to use this image and this box particular, because uh, it's, it's just gonna be, when it all comes together, you'll see exactly why. So I've got the sides here. I just cut the paper dimensionally to fit. You have this up here. So you just got a forest of birds now. And again, I took my, um, my HB pencil and I came in and then drew some other lines and drew some other things, made some areas dark because the image itself was erased when I was doing the photo transfer. But you, everything, everybody can see still okay? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just kind of highlighting this bird's feathers here, giving it a little more depth. I'm gonna get the birds here. All right. One of the things now I want to do is I want to put a little more color into this piece. And I'm going to highlight some of the birds. So I'm going to go ahead and use some chalk. And I want to put some white in here to highlight that bird's stomach. And I'm going to put the white in here to highlight the eye. Just to get a little bit of color. Now, I don't know. I don't have... I don't know how this piece is gonna turn out entirely. I have an idea of how it's gonna turn out, but I'm not 100% sure yet. And then I wanna add some sky. So I'm gonna use some blue chalk in the background. Now this is pretty easy to do, right? So I'm just kind of adding some color. I'm gonna use my finger then to kind of spread the chalk around. So I've got somebody who actually posted a pretty interesting question. Um, it says, I'm assuming it's better to use older book pages so you don't have any copyright issues. Have you ever run into an issue? Never. Um, the one of the things that you, uh, you need to not be afraid of is copyright issues with this stuff. If you're using somebody really famous um, or uh, something that you know is more modern. So yeah, the, the, the individual that asked that question is right. Um, anything from the 1940s, I think, or through the 1950s, those copyright laws are different on it. But one thing that somebody, that a lot of people don't know um, is that um, 
if you only use a partial image, there's no copyright against it. So say, for example, I wanted to uh, cut this image of the mushroom out. This was a, a picture that was taken in a book and in, in a book. If I just cut the image of the mushroom out and just use that versus the entire image, then there's no copyright issue at all. I'm not, I've never had any issues with copyright. I think, you know, a lot of people are scared of that with collage, but it's just to me, I think just go for it. I mean, if they, if they're really going to take the time to sue you or pursue the, the copyright angle and respects to stuff like that, I think uh, they're bored or they just don't have anything else to do. But the copyright stuff in respects to more modern things, you have to definitely be more careful with. So I think that the, uh, the individual who posed that question is definitely right. So I'm just going to continue to highlight that. I want to, I want to just have a little bit of like I'm using some sky. So I'm going to go ahead and go over on this other side as well. Put some blue. Everybody can see. Okay. Still, I'm just really worried about my angles. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can still see. I'm just continuing to go on with the application of the chalk. Just to get a little bit of feel for sky. I'm going to, I actually, in this particular case, I actually really liked that some of the paper stayed on there. I, I liked the light um, shadow effect that the uh, remnants of the paper keep. And I'm just going to highlight this little bird a little bit more because I want to make sure that you can see the outlines of this particular bird and its feathers here. I usually use an HB um, or a two if I'm going to be drawing in boxes. They really seem to work very well. I'm going to just color in the bird's head. I did some highlights here, but I'm going to do some more feathers on this particular bird just to get that going and then just give it a little more belly hair. So there's the, there's the start of the diorama right there. I'm going to just keep it as is hey, now. Yes. Everywhere else, I'm going to put this the mall and stuff. There is a few lines. Oh, if somebody yeah, yeah, could mute Walmart, their microphone, really please. It wasn't a lineup, but it was busy. It no, no, One, only outside, the outside. outside. Yeah. 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 And the non <laughs> are only allowed 15%. Somebody Hi, still needs to mute. Sure that your microphone but is muted, please. Where is it open now? All right. So a <laughs> nice introduction there to whoever that might have been. This is a particular book that I absolutely love, and I'll show that this is the book that I use to find the, the central image that I'm going to go ahead and use, Peep Show Pinups. Um, I really love the uh, uh, idea of pinups, um, both male and female. Um, this particular uh, diorama today is going to be using a nude female uh, pinup, and um, this is just beautiful what they've, the, 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 the imagery of, by Joe and Paul Richardson. They just have, they've captured and found some of the most beautiful pinups in history. And I use this book a lot um, for them. Again, I don't like to photocopy. Um, I just like to try to find the original image in this particular book and then use it. So, in, and that's one of the th questions I get too, is like, how do you find your inspiration? It's basically just sitting here and flipping and saying, hmm, I wonder which one, I think all these people have stories. I think every picture in here has a story for sure, but I, I wanna find an image that I'm gonna be able to use, like this particular image, for example, if you can see that and cut this woman out very delicately and then put her into a story of some kind. And looking through this book, I found this particular image. I just found it to be incredibly beautiful. I don't know. Is the lighting okay on that one? Yeah. But it's a pinup. Yeah. It's a pinup of a woman kind of just looking, showing her beauty and um, draped in this beautiful uh, cloak of sorts. And I thought to myself, when I saw that, I was like, okay, I have my story. And then I went ahead and proceeded to cut out this image. Now, 
again, what I was talking about, she had a lot of just uh, negative space around her and getting as close as you can to the image so it looks like there's no space is really important to me. And it takes a pretty steady hand, but that's pretty much why I use this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful scalpel. So let's just say, and I'll just do this for, for demonstration purposes. I'll take my scissors first, kind of cut the image out. And I'm, I'm not gonna cut the whole image out. And then I'll get as close as I can to the individual, trying very delicately to just get around the individual. I'm, of course, nobody needs to be taught how to cut things out, but it's a lot harder than you think. My, my wife, uh, she tried one day to cut out some pieces and she was just saying, oh my gosh, my hand, it just was not steady. And then I ended up taking hours to cut out an image, but I wanna try as best as I can to get as much of the original image as possible. So I'm gonna just really clean lines, really clean lines here, really clean lines there. So that's pretty much what I did with the, uh, the image that I'm gonna be using today. Not going in first, of course, but she will be going in soon. So in looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, what, what can happen next? Well, I found this beautiful, beautiful fur-like stuff that I just really love. I've actually used this in a lot of pieces. I found this in a scrap store. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that next. I'm gonna use my glue at this point. Get my trusty palette knife here, scoop the glue out, and then affix it down here. The nice thing about Yes Paste is that you can thin it with water if you want to. So you can make it as strong or as weak as you want to. But I like to use this. Now, a question I've been asked before is, can you use wood glue? And the answer to that is yes. But I feel like using Yes Paste, you can pretty much use it on any material. So we've got a nice even layer of Yes Paste on this bottom part. I'm gonna go ahead and affix the fur into the box. Everybody can see that okay? And then it was not quite as long as I had hoped, but I went ahead and cut another piece out. So now I've got that aspect of the collage done. So you can kind of see the sequence and how the blues now are kind of all coming together, highlighted in a sense by this bit of fur. Next thing I'm gonna use is I love, love, love rusted material. I love how beat up it is. I love how it's been tested by nature yet still exists. And that's the one thing I love about art too is it's not impervious. It's gonna continue to break down. I mean, the, the art that we see in museums of course has been around for centuries. I mean. You know, you think about all the most beautiful pieces and how they've been preserved, but they in and of themselves need to be taken care of because they are continuing to break down. But that's one thing that I love about what I find, the material that I find, and then the, the art that I, that I make. Because I think that even some of the paper will continue to discolor over time. And so the art piece itself is gonna go ahead and continue to, to break down, which I think is just a beautiful, beautiful concept. Um, one thing that I absolutely love is I love using metal in my work, rusted metal primarily, but I just found this big thing of wire that I love. And I wanna add some other things here to this piece. So I'm gonna cut a piece of this wire off. Granted, I've already got a piece that I've already um, formatted if I can find it. Make sure you keep a clean workspace. I got a lot of stuff out here for, for this particular piece, but I wanna go ahead and, and demonstrate 
just how you can just pretty much use anything. And I want some clouds. I want some metal clouds in this particular piece. So I'm going to use this thin, thin wire, cut another piece off. Granted, it's not, um, it's not rusted, but I want to make some clouds for this particular piece here. Just some little clouds, happy little clouds. I think Bob Ross calls them. I've already put a couple holes in the wood, but I just took a nail and put in a couple holes right in here so I can go ahead and put the wire in the hole, twist it, and then I've got kind of a little bit of a cloud space. Can you all see that okay? I wish it was rusted, but that's okay. <clears throat> so I've got some organic material here that I found on the beach of Playa del Carmen when I was in Mexico that I just absolutely loved. These beautiful, beautiful pieces of seaweed were affixed or growing out of rocks, which was just, I thought, magical. And when I found them, I was like, I have to bring those home because at some point in time, I know that I'm gonna need them for my work. And this is the opportunity for me to use them in my work. I found a um, top of a soda can or something like that. And then I went ahead and I put this particular piece of organic material or seaweed in the top of this rusted can. I'm gonna use that in this piece of art right now. Someone just commented about brushing vinegar onto the wire to rust it. Have you tried that before? Yes, I have, I have. And uh, not to be crude or anything, but peeing on it too helps. <laughs> if you wanna put a little more DNA in there, you can go ahead and pee on it. Um, but yeah, I There's definitely- There's something new at that. the Doherty Art Center, DAC Demo Days. <laughs> yep, yep. It's, it's in it, in it, you know, and then you set it outside. I'm gonna put a few more clouds in here. I want a little more metal in the background for the clouds. So this piece, this particular piece with the rusted inside or the rusted metal is gonna live over here, I think. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna use that and then I'm gonna go ahead and put a big old blob of the yes paste on there. So it will affix nicely to the material. And then I just go ahead and put it I, I, I like to use this stuff liberally. I never, I never water it down. It takes, you know, a big glob of yes paste like this takes about 24 hours to really dry. So that if you wanna change that process or if you wanna mix the material up, then you can go ahead and you have time to do that. But I'm gonna use that here in my piece. Now, if the glue itself doesn't work, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be hesitant to put a couple of nails in there and just nail it in, which I think would, would not um, detract from the piece itself. But I'm gonna go ahead and just use that for now. So you can kind of see where I'm going along with this piece. I'm gonna, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna, it's a nature scene, of course. And um, I just love how it kind of demonstrates the magnitude of, of nature through these, these trees. I have another piece here, of course, that I'm gonna use. Um, and when I was first doing this piece, I kind of like, huh, I was just gonna put it down like that, but I didn't like how it was so linear and so even. So I needed to figure out a way to get this piece up a little bit higher and that, that the sky's the limit. But in this particular instance, I have this marble. If you can see this marble, you wouldn't think it to be a marble, but it is. This is a marble that I found at a vintage store. It's a Civil War marble. So it was handmade by somebody during the Civil War. 
in that time frame. And I just thought, what an absolutely gorgeous piece of history this is. And what a, what a beautiful piece of art in and of itself it is. And the nuance of it is just gorgeous. And then I think about the story behind this marble, you know, and some kid maybe during the Civil War era playing with this marble in the yard with his grandpa or his his siblings, you know, it, it's just phenomenal. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And I and I just thought I need to use this piece. I've been I've had this this marble for a long time and I thought what a better better way to use this than in today's demonstration. So I'm going to use this as the um, kind of stepping stool, if you will, for this particular tree. I'm gonna use uh, epoxy for this particular application here. There was already a hole in this marble, and so I just chiseled it out. I'm gonna put a small piece of epoxy in it. The thing I like about epoxy is it dries fast and it's super durable. So I'm gonna go ahead and then glue with the epoxy this little tree and then I'm going to put it in the second corner. Hopefully it, it comprehends that it needs to stay in the corner. Let me just get some yes paste on there on the marble to affix that into the corner. little piece out here. Everybody's still seeing okay? My, uh, hopefully I'm not going too fast. I don't want to go too fast. No, you're fine. We all can see. Put a little more epoxy on that. And then I'm going to put it here, hopefully, and it will stay. If it doesn't stay, then, well, c'est la vie. Doesn't matter. All right, might have to fiddle with that a little bit later. All right, so that looks pretty good right now. Now, one of the things about collage, and I wanna just take a minute to talk about this, um, is, is it can be pretty busy. Um, I've done some really busy collage pieces, but I really favor negative space. Um, some of my biggest inspirations in art are the, uh, uh, haiku poets of Japan. And um, I use um, haiku a lot in my poetry. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, in my art for titles of pieces. Um, I just think the simplicity of the 575 when it comes to a haiku um, piece. And then what you what happens when, of course, you you read the three lines in haiku poetry is it just opens up this entire world. Um, I mean, there's been haiku poems that I've read that I, I swear that I've just read an entire novel. Um, and that's the beauty of, of negative space. That's the beauty of simplicity. And I really love simplicity when it comes to work. Um, I have, you know, a couple of pieces that I've done that just have one image and then all negative space. And I feel like as a creative outlet that allows, of course, the viewer to, to interpret what he or she may want to interpret in the piece. Um, and, and I think some of my most uh, favored pieces are the ones that just have absolutely very, very little to do. Um, I'm just trying to find a piece um, that I have that would show, like this piece, for example. And of course, you can find it on my Instagram. But this is uh, the back. Oh, you can't see very good. I'm sorry. Okay, there. That's better. You can see that this is just a book end that had a crack through it. And then I just kind of affixed, this is actually from cut out from an original Polaroid from the 1960s that I then hand embellished. And then you have just all this negative space, but you can use your mind's eye, of course, to see this beautiful scene behind this woman. Um, and, and, I, and I love, love, love that. But my point is, is that collage, can get pretty busy. And that's one thing that I don't wanna do. This particular piece is a little bit busier than a lot of my pieces are, but it's gonna, you'll see that it's gonna turn out to be just absolutely beautiful. All right, so let's find our nude. 
So I went ahead and played with this idea, a couple of different things. I did photocopy it just because I wanted to, that is one thing that I do recommend, of course, if you're using all original material, and if you're gonna be using the original picture in the end, is make a photocopy of it and then play with it. So you can see here that I've taken off the drape because I thought maybe I would take the drape off on her. And I also thought maybe about adding some material, some actual linen on her arms, but it just didn't look right. I'm not a seamstress by any stretch of the imagination and I wasn't able to cut the piece out the way that I wanted to. But I think that if you were to actually take a piece of linen and cut this linen out or even use this as a background and then drape an actual piece of linen over her, it would just be beautiful. But I actually liked the, the brown kind of tobacco color um, of this particular uh, um, drape. And so I didn't want to use that because it just really, this, her skin is just flawless. Um, and I just felt like this, this particular drape in and of itself, like a tobacco leaf, just continued to highlight her. So she's going to go, she's, she's going to be the center piece of this. And pretty much I want to find, let me make sure you guys can see that. Okay. I want to find the exact perfect spot. So I actually need to turn this piece around because that's, I want it. I want the step. You can see that there's a bend in this particular piece of rusted material. And I wanted a step to be here to, for her to be on. So I needed to change that around. And I want her to go about right here. So that's where she's gonna be pretty much. I'm gonna go ahead and use some more Yes Paste, but the idea is that these trees will end up supporting her and supporting this particular image, but that doesn't always work that way. Some of the metal that I use or some of the wire you can use as a, a support for the image. I found these beautiful long pins here that I like to use and they go in nicely. What I'll do is I'll just come and I'll just cut the top off and make a little flat surface. As flat as I can get, put a little bit of Yes paste on the top, not quite yet, I'm sorry. Put a little yes paste in the top. Find out where you're gonna center your figure in this respect. And then you're gonna just go ahead and poke it into the wood as best you can. Sometimes you have to put a little mallet in there. I'll cut them off. I've got a little wire cutter that I love. Whoops, there goes the tree. Just cut that little wire off. That's gonna take a minute to dry. Sorry about that. And then I'll find a little spot where I can get this guy in. Okay, so that didn't work as easily as I wanted it to, but that's okay. I can Someone take a commented sharp... that they like the metaphor of the trees supporting the human. Oh. Supporting humans. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, and that's what it is, right? And all these birds just kind of chilling out and supporting the human as well. And just looking at the grandiosity of life. I'm going to just try to get a little hole in here. Whoops. There goes the tree again. I should have glued that a couple of days ago. I'm sorry, viewers. Bob Ross would say that's a sad tree and not a happy that's a sad. <laughs> that's a sad little tree. All right, let's see if I can get that. Okay, so that's, I went ahead and got the pin. You can see the yellow there. And that's gonna be kind of another support for the paper. Now I'll do my best to put a little bit of yes paste on there. I'm gonna put a little yes paste on her feet. And then a little bit of yes paste that might 
hit the trees and glue up on the trees. Someone else sure commented you, that it's uh, it's good to see some of the challenges, like the tree falling. Yeah, I mean, it's just like you have so many obstacles that you come up against. But yeah, I, I like that I, because it's not it's it's just part of the creative process, right? I mean, it's just I I started out knowing kind of what I was going to do here today, just because I worked with it for a few days. But in all honesty, I'm like, I don't know how this is going to come out. I have no clue. And so yeah, that's that's pretty fun. One of the things too, because I thought maybe I would come up against this is I might put some wire uh, around the tree and then affix it to the box itself to hold the trees up. And that would be kind of a cool, I think, uh, industrial versus, you know, uh, aspect of the, 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 the creation of this piece where you have, you know, science versus nature, if you will. And then I'm going to go ahead and put her there. So she's got the, she's got the wire. The thing about it is, is also, this is such a, you know, the box is so small that it's super difficult to kind of work in here. Even, you know, getting the photo transfer off was a challenge because of all the, you know, the nooks and crannies but it's super important to try to find the right angle to, to, to get, but I want to go ahead and try it right there, but to make it look like she's standing on that platform, if you will. And then once, you know, everything is dried and affixed, you can kind of fiddle around with the, where the pieces go. But she's, and it will dry, it will definitely dry. It's just a matter of getting the right position. I'd want to have her not looking so forward. So bending the head might be a little bit better. And then also this small tree limb here is kind of in the way. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim it. Okay, I'm gonna make that piece a little bit smaller. And then you could actually use that branch in the back to use uh, as a support system as well. I thought that she was gonna be a challenge trying to turn her into something more uh, immortal. Put that there a little bit more. So you can kind of see the end product, if I can just get her to stand up right, darn it. You might just have to fiddle with it because I think centering is important. As you know, in a lot of art, people are like, well, you don't want the, the, the main subject to be right in the middle. So I like to fiddle with left and right a little bit. And that damn tree is, is, is proving to be the most difficult part. But I'm going to put this, I'm going to move the marble out just a little bit so the tree is leaning back a little bit more. Maybe not put her on the pedestal there. So that's pretty much, that's pretty much the diorama. Um, the title of the piece is going to be um, Forest Nymph. And um, I think that you can see why uh, I titled it The Forest Nymph. Um, I probably would want to play with the centering of the image a little bit more, maybe go left or right. I want to make sure that the rusted material is highlighted, the uh, uh, Civil War marble is highlighted, and the trees, of course, are highlighted. Um, as, as, I mean, everything is important, right, because it just tells a story. Um, the, the little pin that I put back there, it may or may not need to happen. Um, once this glues and gets glued to the trees and stuff like that, um, then, you know, she's not going to move. One of the questions you might have um, is like, okay, so this is pretty fragile. I mean, you've used little tiny dollops of glue. You've used things really that aren't that 
supportive. And and it's true. The, 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 the thing is true. I mean, that's how all art is though. I think it's all very fragile. And again, it's not impervious to the test of time. Um, and yeah, in transport, transporting this, you'd have to be very really careful because obviously that tree could fall out. Any of those things can fall out at any time. And so somebody that's, posted a question asking if the figures ever bend or warp with humidity. They can, they can. I had a box of my pieces out in my garage and um, the pieces can warp for sure. Now, one of the things that you can do if you want to spend a little bit of extra time, which I do recommend, is just get a, a piece of cardboard or a piece of mat board, if you will. Like this is just a piece of black mat board. And then I would take this image right here and trace the image and then cut a little bit inside the line to make it a little bit hardier, which I have definitely done for some of my pieces. And then using the glue, it will keep the piece from warping. The paper of course is so, so thin. So I think you know any drastic change in humidity, any drastic change in, in light, um, sources like direct sunlight could cause it to, to warp a little bit as well. So you do have to be careful with that. But I have, I have to be honest, I, um, I haven't had anybody uh, that has purchased one of these from me uh, come back and be like, hey, this thing is falling apart. I, you know, I want my money back. Um, but, you know, the thing is, 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 is like this is uh, a fragile piece of art and, and it's gonna, it's, it's gonna change with time. Um, I don't want the central image to change too much, but there's things that are going to happen, uh, just because of the nature of, of, of the paper and the fragility of the pieces that, um, you know, you're going to have to contend with. I have another piece here that I did and I'm still working on it, but I want to just show this piece real quick. And this is a piece of rusted metal that I used. Same pinup book that I got this image from. And then basically, um, I did not fortify the back with cardboard, but I just, around the back here, I used some acid-free tape and a little bit of yes paste right up here to hold the image inside of this fabricated spring that I, that I made. And then that will be glued inside this particular box right here. And, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted this particular piece to be like a spring to move around. The piece, the title of this piece is Whirlwind. And I just wanted to kind of highlight, you know, the, this, this idea of, of this woman um, in this wedding gown, if you will, uh, it, you know, the whole idea of relationships and, and marriage and so forth just being an absolute whirlwind. But you can see, on this particular image, I used a woman over here from a 1940s Life magazine. And then I used kind of an anonymous person over here, a man wearing a tie, and then found this cool, cool bed cut out like the matrimony bed, if you will. And then, um, then I'll put her in there. And it's just a whirlwind. <laughs> but Someone's asking if you sign your pieces. Um, I do, I do sign them. Um, the, it's a little bit challenging to sign inside, but I found these really cool before I start in a box like this, I've got this great steel stamping set. And what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and find my initials when I'm using this. Um, and then if you just come over, you get yourself a little hammer and you can just You can embed an initial, you can't see it very well, but you can embed an initial in the wood, which I think is really cool. Um, my wife made me this really cool stamp, um, which I like to use um, to sign some of my art as well. It's really cool, just a little image of myself. And then I'll put that on the back typically. Um, and then I'll just like, like this particular piece, I might sign in the corner, but I actually, I actually don't like signed, pieces for some reason. And I know that's, that's, that can be kind of controversial, if you will. I don't know if controversial is too strong of a word, but um, I just feel like, you know, a, a good friend of mine in Chicago, his name is Dmitry Samarov, an amazing, amazing artist. And he doesn't sign any of his work. 
And one of the reasons that he doesn't sign it, he said, is because once I sell it, it's no longer mine. Once I'm done creating it, it's no longer mine. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I like, I don't want a signature to detract from a piece. Um, and and if for, for all you out there that sign um, your work, you know, please don't take offense, but I just don't, I think that signatures can sometimes get in the way. And so if I'm going to sign something like this, I'll sign it on the back. And then I'll just take like a, um, a Posca pin. I love these markers, these Poscas, and then I'll just sign it on the back. Just like so. And then I typically will put a title on it. And then that's what I'll do here. I'm just going to put, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to, you know what I was going to, I think when I initially started out, I was going to tie the uh, desert nymph. So I'll just stick with that. Anyway, it's a nymph. And then I just put the year. I spelled nymph wrong, sorry. <laughs> it was hard for me <laughs> over here. I forgot the H and I don't think I meant to add the A. Sorry about that. <laughs> I did win a spelling bee in, in elementary school. But yeah, that's pretty much my process um, with this particular type. Um, again, I don't typically use photo transfer, but I really thought that the photo transfer in this respect worked well. And I appreciate the comment about the wood grain showing through because that was another element that I really wanted to highlight was the organic nature of this box. Um, and, you know, all art tells a story, right? And, and this to me kind of looked, when I looked at it, when I was putting it all together, to me looked like something out of a, a Shakespeare play uh, almost, or um, in all honesty, I went and saw Waiting for Godot um, at a local theater here and they use these little trees like that and waiting for Godot. And I just thought it was just so simple and just yet so eloquently beautiful. And um, I just really, I just, it's very theatrical. This, this particular piece is very theatrical for me. Like it could actually be on a set of a, a play or something like that. Um, and so, and just the history of, of, of this box, right? And, and, and this, like somebody from Nicaragua uh, hand making this box and then these, these branches growing from the sea and, and that marble, I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, it just all comes together to just tell really the plight of, of this woman almost who, who looks kind of somber. I radiated with this particular image and because I could have used so many different images but I felt like, you know, she was just coming out of the forest and showing all of her femininity in, in such a beautiful, beautiful, eloquent manner. But that's pretty much it. That's, um, that's my process. Um, well, and that's not, you. that's not always my process, but in respects to creating this diorama today um, and showing you what my process is um, it, with these particular boxes, uh, is just, I have so, so much excitement uh, when it comes to creating art. And I think we all should, right? I mean, I, I go back to what Henri said in my reading and, and I mean, what more could you want from, from art than, than just seeing, you know, I feel like, like with this, the, the first process for me was to see the model, and that's what Henri was talking about, but it's just more than seeing because, right? Because what he said was you, you, you can see or express, but you might not see. And so to be able to see what the model might be thinking, and I don't even, this woman's long, long dead, and she certainly wasn't a live model, but my whole interpretation of her was, wow, this woman is a little bit somber. She's I, I just feel like maybe she's even conflicted, you know, with being naked. I mean, who knows, but maybe she needed to earn some money um, for her family. Maybe she's, you know, just being crazy. And she's like, I screw what mom and dad say, you know, uh, I'm going to just go model nude. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go make some money and I'm going to, you know, capitalize off my beauty. You know, I don't know her story, but I felt like that image in and itself 
in conjunction with the rest of the project, just I was able to see and feel what that woman was saying and what that woman was going to do for this particular diorama. But that's kind of what my process is. And I spend a lot of time here at this desk doing that, probably a little bit to the chagrin of my family. But um, they know that this is a little slice of heaven for me, just like I know your studios out there are probably a little slice of heaven for you too. So I, I want to thank you all so, so very much for um, taking the time out of your busy day and, and sitting with me and with Annie and the Doherty. Please, please, please come to my show. If you get an opportunity, I'm going to be in a group show with uh, a number of other talented, very, very wonderfully high-spirited individuals here in Austin in September. And um, I look forward to meeting a lot of you and, and thank you for letting me have this platform. And, and please do check out my Instagram page. I've got a lot of art on there. If you find anything that you might want, please don't hesitate to re reach out to me. Uh, I'd be happy to accommodate you. So thank you once again for this beautiful, beautiful hour of your time. I, I really, really have had a good time. Music